Welcome back to Biotechniques on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to talk about the principles of Western blotting, considering in the previous video we talked about SDS page. And the reason we talk about SDS page first is because in order to do a Western blot, you actually have to first do an SDS page. So Western blots are typically very long procedures relatively speaking, for most of the uh, techniques that you do in an undergrad lab. So the SDS page gel looks something like this after you visualize it with either amido black or kumasi blue. This one's actually kumasi blue that we used. Um, but you actually, like I said, need to have a, a prior SDS page gel made and ready. All right, so before we get into the Western blot procedure, let's talk about what it is. A Western blot procedure is going to allow you to take this gel which has a bunch of different proteins on it. Um, we have this one really bold one in, uh, in all four of these sample lanes, but then down here, look, especially in this first and second lane, we've got 50, maybe 100 proteins in each one. We may not care about all of them. In fact, we probably only care about one of them if we're gonna do a Western blot. So how can we visualize only that one protein? For example, what if it was this bold one at the top? I don't wanna see any of this other crap at the bottom. I just want the one protein here, and I want to visualize that and make sure that I've got it. Well, Western blot is a very, very specific technique that allows you to target that one protein with pretty high accuracy. Before we go into the procedure for a Western blot, the generals of it, let's talk about the basics of antibodies, IgGs, and proteins and how they interact. So first of all, here's a protein of interest. This is the protein I'm interested in. We're actually going to use CYCS for this example. This is cytochrome C, um, a protein involved in the electron transport chain in pretty much every organism. So that's going to be our protein. And I have here an antibody that specifically binds to this protein. Now remember, antibodies are part of the immune system, but they are exploited for a wide variety of biotechniques, including Western blotting, immunofluorescence, and ELISA. Um, but they're very useful because if I have an antibody such as this one that binds specifically to cytochrome C, our protein of interest in this example, this antibody won't bind to anything else. This antibody only binds to cytochrome C. If we were testing, I don't know, actin for our protein, we could design an antibody that binds only the actin. It will not bind to anything else. And this specificity of these antibodies is why the Western blot and other techniques like immunofluorescence and so forth are really, really good. It's because you can specifically target one protein of interest, potentially. And so this antibody is going to have two major regions. First of all, up here, it's going to have an FC region. This is basically the constant region of the antibody. This won't become important until we look at this over here, but the FC region, it suffices to say, plays no part in the specificity of the antibody. Rather, the specificity is, in, is uh, imparted by these variable regions, which are sort of the prongs of this Y. It's like an upside down Y as I'm showing it here. And this variable region shown on the left is specific to its binding to this protein, which happens to be cytochrome C. Okay, This variable region will not bind to actin, it won't bind to hexokinase, it won't bind to anything else, just cytochrome C. Okay. Now another thing that I'm also going to mention that's also important for a western blot is, let's suppose that our cytochrome C comes from a human. Okay, it's a human cytochrome C. The antibody that we have here, which we're going to see is called the primary antibody later, this antibody has to be from a different species. Okay? So it's actually a mouse antibody. Okay? It's also the type of antibody called IgG. There's actually several classes of antibodies. Typically for a Western blot, we use IgG. That's just one class of antibodies. And the way that we name this uh, uh, antibody is it's anti whatever protein it's binding to. So this is anti cytochrome C mouse IgG and it's primary. It's primary because it's binding to the protein of interest. Okay, so that's how we actually name this um, anti cytochrome C because it's binding to cytochrome C and it comes from a mouse. That's also very important because we don't want an antibody that is uh, from the same species as the protein of interest because you're not really going to get binding in that case because antibodies only target foreign proteins, 
right? They don't target, they're at least not supposed to target self proteins. So this could not be a human anti-cytochrome C IgG. It couldn't. This protein in this example also couldn't be a mouse cytochrome C because we would not probably get a mouse antibody to bind to a mouse protein. So they have to be different species and that's very important. All right, now we can also have an antibody bind to another antibody. So let's suppose this is the same primary antibody as shown over here in light blue. It's our primary anti-cytochrome C mouse IgG. Well, we can also have a second antibody called the secondary antibody bind to the primary antibody. And the way this typically works in a Western blot and many other applications such as ELISA and IF or immunofluorescence is this secondary uh, antibody its variable region right here will actually bind to the FC region of the primary. So notice here's the FC region of the primary antibody. This is where the variable region, the, the specificity region of the secondary will bind. Okay. Also notice a couple other things. Uh, this is an anti-mouse FC IgG. Okay, so this part right here, this anti-mouse FC IgG means it's targeting the FC region of this mouse IgG. This is a mouse IgG, right? This light blue. So this tells you the secondary antibody targets and binds to the mouse FC region of, of the IgG. Okay, it's targeting the FC region. But it itself is a goat IgG. So this antibody, this dark blue one, comes from a goat. Again, that's very important because this antibody has to be from a different species as the primary antibody because if this was another mouse antibody, it's not going to target another mouse antibody because that would be autoimmune. It doesn't happen like that. So it needs to be from a, a different species. Okay. So this is the secondary antibody. It's going to bind to the FC region of the primary. Okay. And then of course the primary antibody can bind to the protein of interest. What we're now going to do is piece that together in the general process of a Western blot and see how that allows us to identify and, and locate a specific protein of interest. All right, so this is our this is our SDS page gel after we stained it. So um, these are all of our proteins. We're, we obviously don't care about all of these. Maybe we only care about one. Let's suppose it's this protein right here in my mouse's. That one right there. That's the only one we want to see. Every other protein here we want to get rid of and not be able to see it. It's still going to be there, but we don't want to see it. What we're going to do is we're going to make what's called a blot sandwich, and this is the process is called a blot transfer. So I won't go into the huge specifics of this, but we're going to have uh, our, our gel that we just made uh, next to and really on top of a nitrocellulose membrane. This is one membrane you can do it. This is going to be the membrane where the blot is going to be uh, transferred onto this uh, membrane. And it's going to be sandwiched between two filter paper uh, soaked in buffer. Okay. And it's, you're going to apply an electric field, cathode up here, it's going to be the negatively charged electrode, anode down here, positively charged electrode. And what's going to happen is the proteins still being negatively charged due to the SDS, as we talked about in the SDS page video, they're going to be moved unidirectionally from the gel onto this membrane. Again, that's because since we have a negative charge up here and positive down here, the negatively charged proteins due to the SDS that we talked about, they're going to be transferred downwards toward the positive pole, which means they're going to be transferred onto this nitrocellulose membrane. This is where the blot is going to take place. But the, this blot transfer has to occur first, and generally it's a pain in the butt. Um, my lab that I work in is spoiled in the sense that we actually have a blot transfer machine that actually does this in about seven minutes. It can take a very long time. All right. Once you do the blot transfer, you take out the nitrocellulose membrane, which is, that's one example of a membrane. You take that out, and this is what we call the blot. Now, these are where the proteins are, and it's sort of uh, transparent, translucent, I should say, but um, these are just showing you where they are. You wouldn't actually be able to see these. So this is a blot prepared from the gel, this one. Um, these samples are not really visible. Okay, you would not be able to see this. You wouldn't see anything on this blot when you pull it out of the blot transfer. This is just telling you where they are. This is our protein that we want. That's our cytochrome C. Okay. Now, the next steps is we're going to first do our immunoblotting. 
the immunoblotting is going to do something uh, very similar to what we talked about on the previous slide, but we're going to piece it all together. You're first going to block with a neutral protein. So you want to block um, every spot on this nitrocellulose membrane where there's no protein. Okay, so notice here's just some random protein we don't care about. This is another protein. Here's our protein of interest, our cytochrome C. So what we would actually do is we would actually block all the other spots on here with a protein such as casein um, from usually milk. Um, and that's so that um, we don't have antibodies and stuff adhering to uh, the membrane. We want to block every sp possible spot here. And that's called your blocking step, and you typically do it with some kind of milk. Um, casein protein is the protein that actually specifically blocks these areas. That's not shown here. The actual immunoblotting comes after the blocking step. And it, you do it in a stepwise fashion. There's usually wash steps in between. But the basic idea is you have your primary antibody, as we showed on the previous slide, is going to bind to the protein of interest like this. Okay. Um, you would usually wash after that step. Then you incubate with the secondary antibody. And as we showed on the previous slide right here, the secondary antibody binds to the primary antibody. But there's a big difference, very important difference, than what I showed you here. In the secondary antibody that we used, it'll actually be conjugated to an enzyme. So the way I've shown it here, we have this E. This is an enzyme that's sort of tagged onto usually the FC region of the secondary antibody. Because if we just had a regular secondary antibody on there, it wouldn't do anything. Um, it doesn't help us. So what we do is, is we conjugate prior to incubation. This is already on there. We conjugate this enzyme to the secondary antibody. And what this enzyme will do is it will take a normally colorless soluble substrate. I should probably add that, that this is colorless. It'll take this colorless substrate and convert it into a product that not only is insoluble, but it has a color. Okay, And this insoluble product will sink down here and it will stick on the nitrocellulose membrane. Okay, right here. So this is insoluble, so it comes down here and it sticks there and it will have some color. Okay, So when you actually visualize the blot after all of this is over, Anywhere you see that color is indicative of where the protein is because all of this stuff is in the same area. So I got my primary, my secondary, my enzyme that's conjugated, and then when I convert this colorless soluble substrate into a colored insoluble product, it kind of just settles down here, and anywhere I see this color, that's where my protein of interest is. Notice that for this other protein over here, it never had any primary antibody binding because this antibody is not specific to this protein. So there won't be any insoluble product over here. So I know in this area I don't have that protein cytochrome C, which was my example in the previous um, slide. So anywhere where, that, where I have this color, that's where my protein of interest is. So after all of this immunoblotting, like I've shown here, and then um, conversion to the insoluble product, which is the ECL slash visualization step, I should get something that looks like this. Okay, This band right here, which I tried to make the same color as these uh, insoluble products over here, this is my cytochrome C. Notice there's nothing else on this blot, nothing else, not even in the ladder none in the other lanes, because this right here, this is my cytochrome C. And the reason I'm only seeing this protein now in my western blot is because this initial primary antibody only binds to cytochrome C, or whatever my protein of interest is. Every other protein that's on this membrane, which is all these other ones over here, never gets primary antibody binding because that antibody is so specific. And with no primary antibody binding, there's no secondary antibody binding and no enzymatic conversion to this insoluble product anywhere in the vicinity of proteins like this black one. So that lets me have specificity and now I have my one identified protein that I care about. And this is also a good verification that I do in fact have cytochrome C because if this was not cytochrome C, maybe I made a mistake and it's actually not, then the primary antibody would never bind to this and I wouldn't see this band. This is a very good verification that I do in fact have that protein. And this is the principle of a Western blot. So I'm gonna conclude by saying uh, one thing that's very important. Um, 
there's some other types of applications of, of, of this kind of setup with these antibodies and proteins of interest, such as immunofluorescence and ELISA. Um, both of those processes are, they have slightly different applications, um, but they're actually very, very similar uh, to a Western blot, at least in this part of it, very similar. So kind of keep this general process in mind because we'll see it again in immunofluorescence and ELISA. Hopefully this video made sense. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.